In 2019, U.S. media accused China of bullying in the South China Sea due to its giant terraforming operations to create artificial islands. One of the major consequences of these islands being built up, according to the press, is the possibility of an all-out war with the USA. That's not how China explains things, nor does it admit things could presently be going wrong with these islands. As you'll see in the video today, China might have a major problem on its hands which could turn into a supremely expensive catastrophic failure. Before we get to those failures, we should explain exactly what these terraforming operations are and what they might mean for countries in the region and for all of the US. We'll finish the video with our thoughts on how useful those islands would be in a war with the US. Let's start off with Fiery Cross Reef, said to be China's biggest land reclamation project in the South China Sea. China claims the island, part of the Spratly Islands, for itself, but so does Taiwan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Before 2014, there really wasn't much going on at Fiery Cross Reef, but now it looks like a place that would be useful in a war. As you can see on any map, the area is surrounded by many nations. China claims much of the region as its own, which includes the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands, and also other places such as Pratis Island, the Verrecker Banks, the Macclesfield Bank, and the Scarborough Shoal. China places a nine-dash line around the areas it thinks it controls. But where did China get the idea that everything within this nine-dash line was part of its territory? Who gets to make such decisions when so many countries are nearby? The most powerful country might be China's answer, but its rivals would certainly disagree. China was the world's superpower for centuries. If you look at the history of global GDPs, China and India were both much richer than the other powers in the year 1000. It's believed together their GDPs made up about 50% of the world's total GDP. In the year 1600, that share was 51.4% of global GDP, with China being about 29% and India around 22. From around 1700 to the late 1800s, China was easily number one. Depending on which historian you ask, sometimes these values are slightly different, but no one disagrees that China and India led the world in terms of money. China called Europe a backwater for centuries, when much of Europe really was a backwater compared to the highly advanced civilization of China. This is one reason why China can confidently talk about its ancient maps and records that show various dynasties, including the Song, Yuan, and Ming dynasties, which were in control of the South China Sea. An official Chinese statement to the EU in 2016 said, According to Chinese ancient texts as far back as the Han dynasties, China had large-scale activities of ocean navigation, trade, and fishing, with the South China Sea being the major ground of China's maritime activity at the time. It goes on to say that China discovered these islands, the islets, the reefs, and the shoals, and other countries, and the EU might disagree, nonetheless it explains China's claims. Before China's so-called 100 years of humiliation said to have begun in 1839, China's economy was six times bigger than that of the superpower Great Britain and 20 times bigger than the fledgling USA's. But all this changed, and it changed relatively quickly. During this period, much of China's territories were lost. Due to many factors including China's isolationism, as well as a failure to properly modernize its military and corruption within the Qing dynasty, China experienced a century of military losses. With them, it lost much of its territory. The British kicked this all off with the first opium war between 1839 and 1842. That's when China lost Hong Kong. In the second opium war, 1856 to 1860, the French joined the Brits in beating up China. This was not a good time for China, as it signed what it now calls a series of unequal treaties. The French and the English even looted China's summer palace during this phase in China's history, which even the West now admits was very much out of order. This period was certainly a humiliation for the advanced nation of China, which some scholars say is a reason for its sometimes aggressive attitude. The words never again are now a part of China's political rhetoric. In the Sino-French War of 1884 to 1885, China ceded influence in North Vietnam to the French. Later, after the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895, China lost control in Taiwan when Taiwan fell under Japanese colonial rule. The Qing Dynasty of China had previously annexed Taiwan in 1683. As you know, Japan was defeated in World War II, and then after that, China reclaimed territories, including the areas we're talking about today. In 1949, the Chinese nationalists were defeated by Mao Zedong's communists. The nationalists escaped to Taiwan, but importantly, they still claimed the South China Sea. Prior to leaving it, it was this regime who drawn the territory map, an 11 dash line around the South China Sea. That's why Taiwan still claims to own this territory, but the PRC doesn't see it this way. The reason the line was reduced to nine dashes was because of a treaty between Communist China and Vietnam. 
The history is a lot more complicated than this, but let's just say this entire area is heavily disputed by a handful of countries. Given its history, China doesn't think there's anything to dispute. Nonetheless, China and Taiwan claim the region for themselves, while other countries only claim parts of the region. For example, in 2009, China said China had indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters. Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Brunei disagreed and Taiwan definitely disagreed. It's Vietnam and the Philippines who seem really against China's claims. Over the years, Vietnam has created 49 outposts across 27 different features in the Spratly Islands. The Philippines has built 9 outposts, but none of these nations have done the kind of building China has. As you'll see at the end, the Philippines has just taken a big step toward ensuring China doesn't try to take any more reefs or islets or islands in the region. Such disagreements might make more sense when you understand that about 3.37 trillion US dollars worth of global trade passes through the South China Sea every year. That's about a third of the total trade in the entire world. Almost 40% of China's trade passes through the South China Sea, as does about 80% of its energy imports. Close to 14% of all US maritime trade passes through the area. If this trade corridor was ever blocked, it would cause mayhem in the US, as it would elsewhere. It said around 30% of all global crude travels through the South China Sea. So do about half of the world's fishing vessels. Then you have the rights to fishing there and all the natural resources, including crude oil and natural gas. About $11 billion worth of oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So, if a great big war were to break out, having control of this region would be a strategic feather in your cap. That's one reason why it really matters who the USA takes sides with in the disputes over these territories. Obviously, not China, despite China certainly having a strong claim. Still, other countries also have a strong claim. It should also be said that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has invalidated China's Nine-Dash Line claim. Also in 2016, an international tribunal said China had violated international law by building those artificial islands. Ok, so back to Fiery Cross Reef. We hope after hearing what we just told you, you understand why this 677-acre bit of land is so darned important. The Philippines, Vietnam, and Taiwan might claim the place, but it's China doing the construction there, and there's not much the other countries can do to stop it. The process of reclamation involves dredging sand, soil, and rocks with large dredging vessels from close to the reef. The materials are taken to the site, where they're laid down to create a surface. This space is compacted, and more heavy machinery reshapes and levels the place until the topography is just right. Once the land was raised at Fiery Cross, Chinese workers laid down the concrete and constructed the infrastructure and buildings. This includes an airstrip, aircraft hangars, communication facilities, radar installations, accommodation, port facilities, and various administrative buildings. The island is protected with coastal defense structures. In such a wild place, coastal erosion is more than possible. Creating bits of land in the sea and hoping it'll stay solid is quite ambitious, and maybe even a little foolhardy, not to mention expensive. No one knows exactly what China spent just on Fiery Cross, but it's estimated that it was around $12 billion. And that was years ago, as you'll see later, the upkeep might prove to be a very big expense. In 2014, China stationed about 200 soldiers on Fiery Cross. In 2016, after the 3,125 meter long airstrip had been built, it started landing civilian and military aircraft there, including a military transport aircraft. It was subsequently reported that anti-aircraft weapons appeared on the island as well as a missile defense system. There were also early warning radar sites on the island. This was reported after China had said it had no intention of militarizing the place. It didn't look that way to outsiders. The US State Department soon issued a statement saying there was a pressing need for claimants to publicly commit to the reciprocal halt to further land reclamation, construction of new facilities, and militarization of disputed features. China's artificial islands soon became known as the Great Wall of Sand. While much of the rest of the world is talking about these islands being something close to stationary aircraft carriers or fortresses in the sea, China keeps playing down the fact that they're military installations, while they certainly look like military bases. China has a good reason to want to keep this area secure. It makes sense in a world dominated by power politics, especially in this era where people talk about the balance of power shifting from US hegemony, unipolarity, to a global power balance, bipolarity or multipolarity. China might not want to get into a war with the US and its many allies, but it certainly will want to defend one of the most important strategic areas in the entire world. Still, China won't admit that. 
It has just said it's improving the working and living conditions of people stationed on these islands, or that the islands are for fishing assistance, weather reports, offering shelter, or helping out distressed ships that pass by. Nonetheless, the Western media has pointed out many times that missile defense systems aren't generally required for protecting fishermen. Not all the islands look exactly like military bases, but many do, such as the Gavin Reefs, also claimed by Vietnam, Taiwan, and the Philippines. At just 210 acres, we're talking about a tiny place, about the size of 119 British soccer pitches, if we take those professional pitches as being 1.76 acres. It's now home to anti-aircraft guns and a missile defense system, so again, not exactly fisherman friendly. The aptly named Mischief Reef at 1,380 acres is a much bigger project east of the Spratly Islands. Yet again, when China first started bringing in heavy machinery, some countries asked what China was doing there. It lies just 135 miles off the coast of the Philippines, Palawan Island. When the Philippines asked what China was doing, China said it was a fisherman's shelter. It now looks very much like a military base. The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies released satellite images showing large anti-aircraft guns and probable close-in weapon systems. That said, China is arguably only doing what other nations would do in this world of balance of power politics. China has also built a 2644-meter runway there. The country at least admitted this when it later said the weapons were placed there for freedom of navigation. The Philippines has said this is about one thing and one thing only – conflict or possible conflict. An international tribunal later ruled that it and other nearby reefs were low-tide elevations that do not generate entitlement to a territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, or continental shelf, and are not features that are capable of appropriation by occupation or otherwise. In short, these reefs are not for building military bases, and since they're not classed as a nation's actual territory, the U.S. doesn't have to legally make a so-called innocent passage past the islands because in terms of international law, there are no islands to speak of. China made something out of nothing. You can see China's progress through a series of satellite images taken over the years, which amounted to turning almost nothing into something. It's a similar story with Subi Reef. Once a piece of wild reef, now a developed bit of land with a military base, a harbor, and a landing strip about 3,000 meters long. Some of these islands are home to laser and jamming equipment. Fighter jets could land there. There's absolutely nothing about the island that screams fisherman's shelter. In the past, when the U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft have flown through the area, they've been warned that they've strayed into China's airspace. One of those radio messages said China has sovereignty over the Spratly Islands, as well as surrounding maritime areas. Stay away immediately to avoid misjudgment. The pilot shot back, well not literally, I am a sovereign immune United States naval aircraft conducting lawful military activities beyond the national airspace of any coastal state. Exercising these rights is guaranteed by international law, and I am operating with due regard to the rights and duties of all states. It's on these missions that U.S. aircraft have seen that these islands are a bit more than places where fishermen can put their feet up for a few hours. Images show harbors that can take at least 40 military vessels. They expose runways big enough for bombers and enough weapons to turn disputes into something ugly. A U.S. Navy spokesperson said they threaten all nations who operate in the vicinity and all the international sea and airspace. That's the reason for sojourns through the area, what the U.S. calls freedom of operation missions. These operations, phonops, are what the U.S. call operational challenges against excessive maritime claims, whereby the U.S. demonstrates its resistance to excessive maritime claims. China is no fan of phonops, once calling a particular operation a serious infringement on China's sovereignty. It's not only the U.S. that conducts them. In recent years, Japan, the U.K., Australia, and France have all launched phone ops, to which China usually invokes words such as escalation and provocation. But critics of this Chinese mission in the South China Sea have said the escalation started when China started building the islands. In all, there are seven reclaimed pieces of land with a total area of 5.2 square miles. It might not sound like much when you put it that way, but you can get a lot of weapons and runways in that amount of space. Also, to put these great chunks of concrete in the sea, China's had to upset the local ecology. At Mischief Reef alone, which is about six miles long, China had to bury the original natural reef under millions of tons of sand and gravel. For all the islands, we're talking about many, many millions of tons of sand and coral that had to be dredged and dumped. When China started building these islands, people not overly concerned about military strategies and war warned that there was a good chance that these fake islands could wash back into the sea. 
which in short would make life for marine animals and plants very hard. You have oil and chemicals and all sorts of dirt that could form clouds of matter that the sea doesn't need. One professor argued that all we've really heard about is military threats and the environmental threat has largely been ignored. He told the media, the worst thing anyone can do to a coral reef is to bury it under tons of sand and gravel. There are global security concerns associated with the damage, it's likely broad enough to reduce fish stocks in the world's most fish-dependent region. On top of this, Taiwan is saying China is stealing its sand, so Taiwan had to ramp up its Coast Guard efforts. Some say China's done this as a warning, and also to ensure not as much money is spent on Taiwan's military. In 2020, the Taiwanese military cracked down on 4,000 Chinese sand dredgers and sand transporting vessels, which was a 560% increase from 2019. The country says these operations are wrecking not only local ecology, but also undersea internet cables. So, we have islands by the sea that by international law should not be there. They've been built on unstable ground, and as you know, this ground could erode and wash back into the sea. There might be no way of stopping this. China might be a technological powerhouse, but nature always has a way of saying, keep out. Reports have stated that on some of these islands, concrete is crumbling, which means the very foundations of these islands could wither away and what stands on them could collapse. This is reportedly happening not because of any freak weather, just because the islands are in such an unforgiving area. Matters could be made much worse if a typhoon hits. There's also tectonic activity that could easily shift their foundations, while natural erosion could also cause the subsidence of these islands. There's also a natural process called sediment consolidation. This means the material that was laid down can become more compact, and when that happens, the entire island could move downwards, aka sink. These islands are so low that global warming also presents a threat. If the sea level rises, it might swallow the islands. It's said the global average sea level has been rising at an average rate of about 0.07 to 0.14 inches per year over the last century, but global warming might accelerate this. It's not certain what will happen, but low-lying islands are certainly within earshot of danger. In fact, it is possible that within decades, some of China's artificial islands could be totally swallowed up by the sea. That's if war hasn't finished them off long before that. The islands might well be sinking, and if they are, they could end up being huge wastes of money. Being so far away from the Chinese mainland, they aren't exactly easy to maintain in terms of structural problems. But even if they're not sinking, you have to ask what use they would be in a war. If it ever came to that, the US would likely strike at the three main islands with ballistic missiles, using electromagnetic warfare technology to get past the island's air defense systems. The US might also just form a blockade and starve the islands of food, weapons, or other materials. This would be quite a task given China's navy now is big or bigger than the US navy, although it doesn't have the same combat experience or missile strength. The main islands can hold a few fighter planes, likely 24 for each island, or even a bomber or two, but in the large scheme of things, a stationary target is a lot easier to hit. That's why one military analyst asked, are they a military asset or a liability for Beijing? There's no doubt that if war did happen, the US Navy can neutralize these islands with cruise missiles. One analyst believes it would take 30 to 50 cruise missiles for every one of the biggest outposts. As the aerial photographs show, the critical infrastructure on these islands is lumped together. It would not be hard to hit something important, while penetrating munitions would cause damage to structures that seems are already eroding. The US Air Force could send in strategic bombers armed with cruise missiles sent from a number of bases. China might have enough aircraft shelters for its fighter aircraft, but with one runway, it would soon start to look congested down there, and any strike would quickly make that runway unusable. With US submarines, you also have supply issues for China. China does have enhanced anti-submarine warfare capabilities, meaning US submarines still pose a problem. This could be one reason why China has invested so much in submarines as of late. China's islands have rightly been called a challenge to enemies of the regime, but in the event of war, it's hard to see China being able to keep them. They certainly are a substantial presence in the region, but more so to smaller nations. The US could deal with them, we think. The US has seen its fair share of military failures over the years. The US would suffer greatly in the effort of trying to destroy them, there's no doubt about that. That is, if China can save them from sinking or falling apart before that happens, which we imagine will become a very costly venture for China. It seems the country is willing to spend the money, having reportedly just built the world's largest suction dredger that is 50% more powerful than the so-called super dredger used previously. The old one was 6,017 gross tons and had a dredging capacity of 4,500 meters cubed per hour that was said to be the largest in Asia, so the new one is something special. 
What does this mean? Well, for one thing, it seems China is certainly getting ready to do some more dredging. That's why the government in Manila believes that China might move on to other islands in the region. It's the reason, or one of the reasons, why after 30 years, the Philippines is opening up its doors again to a U.S. military presence. U.S. troops will have access to four new military bases there. As China digs, the U.S. is setting up shop, just like it did during the Cold War. How this ends is anyone's guess. Now you need to see another aspect of the global conflict, in how U.S. just paralyzed Chinese manufacturing overnight, or have a look at why Apple is rushing to move production out of China.